This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, July 19th, 2022. Uh, this is the regular July meeting of the Davenport Public Library Board of Trustees. And we are meeting in the small meeting room at the library in Maine. My name is Steve Emming, president of the Library Board of Trustees, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. First item on our agenda is um, roll call and introduction of attendees. So I'll call the roll. Um, Malavika Shikandi. Okay. Present. Okay. Uh, Judy Lance. Present. Joe Heinrichs. Here. Uh, Craig Cooper. Here. Uh, Tom Engelman is not here yet, but uh, we're expecting him, so we'll wait and announce his attendance. Um, and I'm present. My name is Steve Emming again. Um, Sylvia Roba, Amanda Motto, and Laura Gennis um, are not able to be with us today. So um, also in attendance, we have uh, Jeff Collins, a library director, Lexi Riley, assistant library director, uh, Jennifer Williams, uh, HR operations manager, uh, Tracy Moore, development officer, uh, Casey Chipley, recorder, and Marion McGinnis, our city council uh, liaison. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. I can have a motion to approve the consent agenda. I so move, Steve. Thank you, Malvika. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Joe. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? Hearing seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Um, Malavika? Yes. Judy? Yes. Joe? Yes. Craig? Yes. And my own vote is yes. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is public with comment. Seeing and hearing no one, we'll move on. Next um, item on the agenda is reports and communications. Uh, first item there is friends. I was at the Friends meeting, and um, I recall that uh, the main part of the meeting was um, a report from their financial advisor on the status of the investments of the Friends of the Library, which, uh, you know, have declined based on everything else that's going on in the market, but still are in good shape. So, um, well, I don't recall, Jeff, do you recall anything else from the meeting? <laughs> uh, nothing else from the meeting. There is one other thing to pass on from the friends, and Melvika shared this yesterday via email. There is a fundraiser that they had started yes. for uh, T-shirts that say, uh, ray gun T-shirts that say Davenport needs public libraries. Yes. So those are available to purchase for anybody in the public that is interested. So I encourage you to share uh, with your family, friends, and anyone else. They're cost of $25. There's four color varieties. And I believe the friends get uh, about $10 of that as a fundraiser as well. And they're here available already. They are. Yep. Okay. Next item on the agenda under reports and communications is committee reports. Uh, Tom's not here yet, so we'll circle back around with him. Um, personnel, uh, Amanda asked me to remind everybody that um, that we're changing our evaluation process because um, since Jeff is new as our director, um, he's under the mandatory six-month probationary period with the city. So the, the process will be that uh, Jeff will provide the board with a report on his progress towards his goals and objectives at three months, which he's done, and at six months. Two, um, an evaluation will be performed by the board at six months, which will be in August, and which would include the completion of surveys by the board, uh, all staff and the supervisory staff. Um, so, and then Jeff's annual evaluation will be performed at nine months in November, uh, which would include only board surveys. Um, and that comes about because the um, evaluations, um, according to our accreditation, I believe, have to be completed by the end of the year, so we'll do that in November, so we'll be in good shape and having that all complete. Um, she also said with regard to the six-month evaluation, staff surveys will be sent out 
tentatively from July 20th to the 29th. And then, um, and that's, I guess, sent out and received back, uh, but anyway, tentatively between those dates. And then provided to the board for review. Uh, the board surveys will be sent out on August 1st and will be due back on August 10th. And uh, to contact her if you have any questions. Um, and um, yes, that's that's the personnel co committee report. Unless you're aware of anything else, that you can, uh, okay. Um, okay, moving along then. Advocacy, Malvika. Oh, uh, Jeff, thank you. We've already touched on the T-shirts. I just wanted to add there were a few friends when I shared it, uh, friends and neighbor neighbors, and they said, "Oh, it's something for little babies, maybe, or something like that." I said, "That's a great idea. I'll just pass it on." You know. So that was that was that. Uh, I have spoken with. Um, I was there at the parties in the park, but I was uh, uh, volunteering with the Vineyard Museum that day, so, uh, and. Uh, uh, we did move. Uh, there was there were a few students. Uh, there were a few little kids who came by for various things. We talk, of course talked about the museum, but we and they said something about books, and we said, oh, you can go right there, like you know, all is right down there, etc. So, uh, uh, so we, we did something like that. And at, at one of the Figgy meetings, I have mentioned to them because they expressed interest of going out more, just like the parties in the park, which is they're doing it for the first time. And I had spoken to Bianca before I made a mention to them, is uh, Bianca said that our block party is sometime in August, August 13th, I believe. And so I did mention to them about the block party and uh, the education department of the Fili, uh, if they would like to come and you know, have some cards. And, and uh, they Bianca did share that we other vendors who might be coming this so this is what I want to share with you all. It's an excellent meeting. Thank you, Lexi, the DEI. Yeah, last week, I believe. Yes. <laughs> and we had a very interesting we talk about different policies. We had a very interesting discussion about uh, you know the different kinds of things that we have to take into account when we make changes to policies. And there was uh, great output from everybody who were there. I think we're not going to meet this month because of various vacations and things like that. So we'll be meeting next month. Lastly, a plug. This is an excellent seed library that we have in the library. And I have a huge batch that I have just cleared last weekend. So these will go there. And after they come up, and I'm <laughs> so we have an excellent library. And they have just excellent seeds upstairs. So. Um, that's all, Steve. Thank okay. you. Thank you. <laughs> so get your seeds at the library. Seeds and t-shirts. I understand you do not have to return. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Malvika. Uh, next item under reports and communication is the director's report. Is there anything you want to add or from your report to yeah, thank you. So just one thing to add, uh, that very first bullet point where we talked about the CAFE RF, uh, RFP. Uh, the pre-bid walkthrough that occurred on July 12th, we had nobody that attended that. However, uh, there still is time for individuals. It's not, it wasn't a requirement to attend. Okay. And there are still our time for businesses to uh, put in their bid. The, that would be due, I believe, it close on this Thursday uh, at the end of the day at 5 o'clock. So, Still a couple of days on that, so we'll see what happens. Not sure what's going to, how that's going to play out. Uh, and then one other uh, item of business is just a uh, uh, little free libraries. Have has everyone heard of these in the past? So the uh, little free library we re, uh, received con um, uh, some information from a local nonprofit that had uh, some already constructed that they were offering out to uh, different organizations. So we took advantage of that, and now we are going to receive four Little Free Libraries. Uh, and we're going to be looking at installing those four at a couple of different locations in the community. So that will come along sometime uh, in the next uh, six months or so. We're hoping to get those installed, possibly uh, one up on the grounds of Fairmount, one at uh, one of the parks, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then we'll also make sure we have those branded with uh, 
our logo, uh, depending if uh, we are able to go to some of the parks, we might have the parks logo on there as well. Uh, and then some of the uh, items that are going to go in there are going to be either um, handled through to friends, essentially. So either donations that didn't sell or um, some discards from the library collection that we'll be able to stock. So just a heads up that that's coming down the pipe at some point. Four more branches. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Can we make suggestions of a park? Yeah, sure. Bridgeview Park. Bridgeview. Oh, yeah. There's not a library really close. Yeah. When are you getting those books? When are you getting them? The boxes? The boxes? Right. Uh, we might actually already have all four of them. So the reason why I ask, to your point about Bridgeview, if you decide that's where you want to go, there is a party in the park yes, on is. August 11th there. And that might be, you know. That might be a little too quick for us. Okay, all right. <laughs> I don't know if we'll have it ready quite. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it is. It's a good suggestion. I mean, temporary. Yeah. We want to miss it if it was Right, possible. I mean, there will be a lot of people there. Good idea. Yeah. yeah. And otherwise, I'd be happy to answer any questions if he has about the report. The, banner, the banners look great. Yeah. I just want to show this one. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for pointing things like that out because otherwise, you just get so used to, you know, your sure. little path. Yeah. yeah. And nobody yeah. looks around. So yeah. Yeah. I'm a pal around in those yeah. things. So. Well, we've got a great team that have worked on that and uh, done some modifications. So these ones, the most recent batch, are going to have. They're um, stitched, and they are also going to have some wind gusseting. So hopefully they're going to last a little bit longer, mm -hmm. uh, not as much stress and wear and tear on them as well. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to share with you, I've completely forgotten about it, uh, at Hy-Vee on East, and off Spring Street is East Kimberley, sorry, East Kimberley, uh, that book drop uh, that we have yes. in the corner. Yes. I, it has Thank a, heaven, this was so bad. Yes, it has that. One was ugly than the other exactly. one. Exactly. <laughs> Where do I put them in? We put the, yes. So, and people put on Fanway, so I was going to say, Thank you for that. Yes, that, thank you so much for adding that wrap around oh, no. that. that uh, and it was somebody who said, because um, oh, it looks lovely, and I said, uh, uh, you know, earlier they said we could not make out that there was a book drop there, I and now you could, you know, so they kind of like, like a looks like a really elderly dumpster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it looks lovely now. Yeah. It looks lovely. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Okay. Uh, next um, item under reports and communications is council liaison. Okay, not a lot new. Um, just a party in the park, you know, library's already there. They've been fantastic this year. I just don't know how to say it. They are perfect. Even most of the time, the weather um, is the right mix of people. We've run out of hot dogs sometimes, which is the best thing. It's a mix of people in every park, so it isn't, you know, and we're kind of uh, in, in broader places. I see the same people again. They come. You know, like from a different part of town, and that's really cool. So, um, in any case, so they are uh, probably we just keep thinking this one's the best so far. This one's the best. No, this one's the best. No, this one's the best. <laughs> so, in any case, um, so I think they're doing what we want them to do. Um, um, Canadian Pacific, there really may be an announcement coming soon. Um, I can't say any more than that, but um, but we believe that there is a um, there is a um, first cut sort of in August with a the transportation board and so it's kind of going to be important so I think that's winding down and hopefully we'll have some good news from that um, um, you we will probably also there will be something coming in um, the first cycle of August in destination Iowa this is the money for sort of it's more tourism related it's sort of like um, um, the older um, I can't remember what it's called, What's it called? anyway um, and we will be making applications as a city, and there will be some not-for-profits making applications for money separate from that. Um, so you'll be hearing about that, and that's what that is. Um, the two-way, um, there is um, this week and next week, there's management update meetings. Um, the first one is uh, the staff came back, has come back with um, their the questions that were asked at the public meetings about turning the one-ways to two-ways. Um, and they will come back. We will have a report today on that, and then there will be a work session 
next week, which on Tuesday, which I expect to be fairly contentious, perhaps. Um, and then it will probably come to council. Um, if you have any interest in this, I really would suggest you come to camp. Those the two meetings, the two meetings you can come to the meetings this week and next week, but they're not public input meetings. It's the work sessions. But then probably this will come before council the last two weeks in August. If you have any interest, concerns, advocacy, please come. We hear from sort of one, you know, you hear from, you don't hear from, anyway. So, and I'm going to be going out talking to people. So if you are, it's very important that, and I think it will be on the, um, I'm sure it will be on um, not part of the consent agenda the second week. So the committee, the whole, for the discussion, and I'm sure it will be on discussion for the next week because it is, you know, a, a, a thing that people have lots of feelings about. So we usually try to not put those in consent. So there'll be two opportunities there. Or if you want to reach out to people on the council. In any case, that's happening. Um, one other thing, I know the discussion um, about the building that's going up over here. Um, just keep in mind that um, Wells Fargo actually has a parking deck across the street in that building. So that may be um, that I'm guessing that that will accommodate some of the, if they, I'm sure they're going to have to pay extra, but there is, you know, unlike some buildings that have been built that have no parking, which is legal in the city, that there's actually the owner of the building that's being constructed actually has a, um, has a, um, and I think these are going to be fairly small apartments too, um, like one bedroom and studios. So in any case, so um, I don't think I have anything else unless somebody has questions for me. What are the uh, qualifications for the uh, nonprofits? Um, it is it is it is very much based toward tourism okay. and those kinds of things. So um, um, it is it is not a um, you know there you could go on and look. It's very it's you have to you have to so. The, it's a 40-60, so whoever's applying has to kick in 60, um, and um, then and, and they there is a separate pool of money for not for profits. So there is, but it's they have to be paying 60 and 40 percent, and it is related to tourism more than it's it's not related to like neighborhoods or anything like that. So it's really related to kind of what's and that was the way. I mean, the point is to get. You know, it's it's sort of economic redevelopment sort of stuff. So, in any case, but it is a 4060, and so um, um, if you go to destination, if you Google destination Iowa, it, you can see the details. I will tell you, I'm not an absolute expert. It's very confusing to me, um, but um, check it out if you want to check it out. Okay, that's it. <coughs> Um, just one thing to pass on from the library's perspective on the third and fourth streets for the one way. Uh, obviously, for Maine, uh, we share one wall, one side of the building, the north side with fourth street. Uh, in terms of impact for the library, the main impact would really be what we do with our book drop because our book drop is directly next to uh, the sidewalk. So if you're driving right now westbound and you're driving, you pull in and there's the book drop right there. So we'd have to determine what to do if that then becomes an eastbound for the driver to be able to drop off. To all, as far as an alternate, uh, we might need to relocate that to a different spot or something uh, of that nature. Uh, and then the other concern is for staff because of our, and the public for parking, because we do park um, and, and public parks across the street at the northeast side, uh, right next to that intersection. So uh, it might be a little bit more challenging for them coming across the street. They'll probably need to go to the stoplights and use the crosswalks. Yeah. Jaywalking is not good. With it, with it too, it's more challenging. It's not good and, enough, yeah. and, and I just want to make clear, those are very, very, very small concerns for this big, big issue. Uh, but that's how what we believe is going to impact library and library patrons. Yeah. And again, very, very, very small. Instead of putting an island out in the middle of the two right <laughs> <laughs> uh, trying to get the trees and everything. Yeah. <laughs> but, that staff has well. to go, we have to go out there and retrieve the items. So it's kind of like a, a frogger situation <laughs> oh, yeah. with somebody with a book card out there. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I prefer to mention a Frogger a lot. <laughs> okay. Anyway, just to back up a bit, uh, this is what um, anybody might be doing to uh, recognize that uh, Tom Mingleman has now joined the meeting. And uh, with that, uh, that's the end of the com communications reports. So I'll circle back to finance. Tom. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> well, if you look at the uh, uh, the uh, budget report that was issued, I mean, we were at the end of the year, so we're at 100 percent, and our expenses were right there. So, you know, obviously things have stayed. Um, very controlled as we go through the year. So they've been talking on the phone too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we ended up with money left over in other places. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have consistently uh, had money left over at the end of returns. So that's good. Anyway, okay. Any questions um, on the finance report? Okay. Seeing and hearing none. Moving on. Thank you, John. Um, okay, next item is new business. Here we go. Back to election of officers, which we've never exactly figured out how exactly we should do this. So um, let me just say that, um, uh, okay, so Thomas here, so I don't have to say I've spoken with him, although I have, and I have spoken with Sylvia. Um, the three of us um, are willing to stand for re-election, um, if nominated, and um, Floor is open for nominations, so um, may I have some? Do we nominate by position? Do we start with one yes. position? Yeah. President. Start with president. Yeah. I nominate Steve. Okay. Second. Second. I've, been, I've been nominated. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Um, Steve, I do nominate Steve Emming. Yeah. Okay. No. Anyone else? I mean, anybody else want to nominate someone else? <laughs> Okay. Um, okay, for vice president? I'll nominate Sylvia. Sylvia? Okay. Currently the secretary. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Who's current? <laughs> okay, who's current vice president? I'm, I'm current. Oh, I nominate Tom Engel. I'm sorry. We'll be a slate. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, anyone else for. Uh, Anyone else want to nominate someone for vice president? Okay, I haven't seen that. Uh, then for secretary. Do I dare? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll nominate Sylvia. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to nominate someone for secretary? I, someone I else nominate for Sylvia. Okay. Okay. okay, so I guess we have three candidates. So we'll uh, we'll go from there. Um, uh, well, I now I, I move the nomination cease and a unanimous vote be cast. Okay, we can. But wait, do that. they didn't give their campaign speeches. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to go put on my sign. Those politics in the library. Or maybe I'll resign. <laughs> Can we do unanimous consent, or do we have to actually? I think we can. I think we can. Yeah. We don't, let's put it this way. We don't have any, we don't, you know, we, there are no other candidates, and I hadn't thought yeah. about that. I was just, when I was talking before about ballots before the meeting, I was considering the possibility that there, you know, might be, you know, three or four people nominated for each position. So. Of course. <laughs> anyway. Um, but no, I think uh, Tom has a good point. We can um, just do this uh, by unanimous consent. Um, plus, there are any objections? Objections? Okay. All for the vote. All in vote of the. Um, myself, Steve Emming for president. Uh, Tom Emming for secretary. Um, Aye. Anyone opposed? The election has been to our best to represent you going forward. 
this is committee assignments. I have no surprises. So uh, for personnel, um, Amanda has agreed to chair that committee. Greg, has, that was his choice. So have him on the personnel committee also. And Laura Guinness, our new uh, trustee um, who couldn't be here today, um, also uh, was first interest for personnel. So I put her on the committee also. For advocacy, um, same as yes, it was before I guess. Malavika, I put as chair Judy and Sylvia, and for finance, again no changes. Tom Engelman, chair Joe Heinrichs, and myself. So those are the committees for the next term. Any questions, comments, concerns? So, um, I, I guess one thing I would say in regard to committees uh, that I'm going to ask uh, the chairs is to um, you go forward and try to find ways to um, include the other members of the committee, uh, mainly so that we can uh, have kind of a development process to uh, identify future people for um, be chairs of committees. So uh, just a thought there. Appreciate your efforts in that regard. Moving on to old business. Um, first item there is approval of the bulletin board slash community board posting policy, which we um, I have a motion in that regard. I so move. Okay. Steve. I'll second. Okay. Thank you, Lisa and Tom. So we have a motion to approve the bulletin board slash community board posting policy. Uh, is there any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, I will call for the vote. Judy. Uh, yes. Thank you. Joe. Yes. Tom. Yes. Craig. Yes. Yeah. Malavika? Yes. And my own vote is yes. Motion carries. Next item under all business is approval of the behavior policy. Um, before we do that, there's been, a, there's been a change since we saw this last? Or? There is. Okay. Could, would you mind going, uh, telling us about that first, Jeff, before we uh, it'd be easier? Just maybe not quite exact proper Rogers rules, but uh, that'll save us amending the motion that otherwise would be made. <laughs> sure. Yeah, so based on the discussion we had at last month's meeting, uh, we added in a statement at the top that says any behavior that is prohibited by law. And we also uh, modified uh, the fourth to the last bullet point on the bottom based on uh, recommendations that we had received. Um, from City Legal. I had reached out to uh, Tom Warner uh, last month regarding solicitation. And the City Council's in the process of doing this. They have their first consideration to amend their current ordinance. Uh, and then what they're planning on doing is amending Chapter 9.08, uh, specifically 0 .050 and 0 .080. And as for disorderly conduct, they're going to repeal those two sections. Uh, and I don't know how much detail you'd like to know about this, but in essence, uh, solicitation, the way that the, the ordinance is written, uh, does not work. Uh, it's no longer something the city can do. Okay. Uh, so with that understanding, uh, library's recommendation is to remove soliciting, handling, and gambling from the behavior policy under prohibited behavior. Okay. So that leaves petitioning in there? Yes. Okay. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And no other changes to this policy in, in conjunction the lawyering policy is one that would also go away in relation to what we just talked about. Okay. Thank you. For that. Yeah. So is, yes. I had a question. So is, and I should know this, um, I hadn't thought about it in the scope of the library. And I, do, I mean, part of the problem is that these laws are being struck down mm -hmm. and that's why they're having to do it. But 
you are in an enclosed space. You're not on the street. You're in a building. So does this mean people can, what is, what is the definition of petitioning? Is it a broader term so that it can be less targeted? So it sort of less targets a certain population? Right. So the soliciting aspect of this is something that um, they decided is not um, legal to enforce. Uh, for the petitioning part, what we would do is we would still um, not, we would still prohibit uh, individuals from getting signatures and petitioning okay. in that respect. So it's not the soliciting part, it's the petitioning part. Right. So that's what we'd still be hoping to address. And otherwise we could address the behavior if, if it does uh, become harassing in nature. So that's where we would still be covered in the behavior policy under the, one of those first bullet points under okay. harassing in nature. By, by taking out panhandling and gambling, does that mean that someone could challenge because it's not part of policy? Correct. Yeah, technically, um, that's the way we've interpreted the law is that panhandling, panhandling is legal, and the city we were using we were using the ordinance that the city had established, and that is going to be going away. Who wants to play blackjack? <laughs> so people can sit around and play cards. Yes. In the right. library. Yeah. Because the, they can right now sit around if they're in a private room and play cards. Technically, yeah. I mean, that's okay. technically, well, I guess it depends on what you define as gambling. <laughs> right. yeah. Probably not crafts. <laughs> yeah. uh, but yeah, if somebody were to uh, borrow a study room, check out a study room, and they could go into the study room and they could play cards if they wanted to. So is there any, uh, let me ask you this, is there any policy that, I'm just trying to think through this, because it's, is there any policy that prohibits things that do that raise money? In other words, you could, you know, a gambling game could be seen. I mean, gam literally gambling could be seen as raising money, right? And we don't. I mean, we we don't allow commerce in the library, right? Right. So that would be addressed okay. through the meeting room policy. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, All right. Okay. Of, so the answer to that question. Yeah. Not not the pizza stuff, but could someone have a bingo party? Space and not if they're being paid money for it, because then that becomes commerce, right? I believe so. I believe our meeting yeah. room policy would address that. that. Um, we also, yeah, yeah, I, I met a group. A group calls the library, calls you, and said, "Do you want to rent the room to do this? It's a fundraiser. We're going to play game." Yeah, at that for, at that point, we would follow the meeting room policy. The way this is, um, the intention of this one is to make sure that somebody isn't coming into the library and they're not uh, walking around asking every single patron, you know, yeah. can I have money, can I have money, can I have money, can I have money? And typically we would have preferred to keep that in there so that we don't want uh, library patrons to feel harassed in any way. However, with the ordinance going away, that's not something we can do anymore because like, we're relying on the city ordinance for that. Okay, but okay, I would put. I'm honestly, I think I would push back a little bit. Why it feels it like say? because this is a you know this is a yeah. this is a it's a public building, but you have your own patrons, and it's not like city hall where they would show people the door. I think if they came in panhandling, it is a it is it is. I think I'd push back on that a little bit, Jeff. I mean, I think there's, I think there's reason to push back. You have a different. This is a place where the public is welcome, and it isn't an open space. It's just not like the. It's just Careful not. Like, well, it's not the street. It's not the street. I understand all of that with the street, but I don't understand why in a building, where the public is there for. Well, you're and you're raising some interesting, um, uh, some valid concerns for sure. Uh, we recently experienced some challenges uh, in terms of the controversy that we had, the, the program that we had that generated controversy last month, uh, because we were attempting to enforce our behavior policy, right. and uh, both City Legal and the Davenport PD did not support us in that uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, we, we, we say what can and cannot be allowed by your legal authority uh, on library property which includes the main entrance to the library. 
and uh, those uh, individuals who are expressing their First Amendment rights, which we also want to support, they were allowed to be on library property at the entrance to the library. Because it's city, at the end of the day, city owned? Um, I, I, can't, I can't speak for why they decided that, but they chose not to enforce that particular aspect. Um, yeah, I think what I would suggest is we go ahead and approve this, and then we can you know, maybe decide it in such a way, you know, check back to city legal. Or and or another or option, too, is we could approve the behavior policy with and just still leave soliciting, petitioning, panhandling, gambling in here for now, because uh, technically that ordinance hasn't passed yet. It's just the first consideration. Okay. And um, city legal has not responded uh, to my emails about this. Okay. So that's another option too. We can leave that part in. Okay. So uh, does uh, do my colleagues have a suggestion on what they think would be the best action? I'm certainly willing to the library. I'm not. I mean, you guys vote, but I am willing to advocate for some a re. I am willing to do that. I don't know if it makes any difference or not, but I think it's different. It's not the public works building. It's not city hall where you can only get on one floor. It's different. It's a different situation. So, so yeah. Yes, I would move that we leave the line in pending legal opinion. No. Well, we we can just leave it in for now, yeah. and we'll we'll we can come back in the future, right? You know, next month, next year. Yeah, we can approve the policy as written with yeah. the exception of that, leaving right. that one in. So the changes would be the behavior that's prohibited by law and then the eating or drinking in uh, special collections of the space areas. Um, I'll withdraw the motion and then you guys can board it however you think it should be worded. <clears throat> Um, so, um, was petitioning added then? That's an addition? No, that's not an addition. That yeah, was there uh, apologies, that should not be red. That should just okay. be okay. black. That was in there. That was my fault. That's, that's okay. Just check it. Um, so then, I will... Uh, okay, so here's what I'm going to do. So, I would entertain a motion to approve the behavior policy, including soliciting, panhandling, and gambling, uh, which were previously identified to be deleted. So moved. Okay, thank you, Tom. Is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, is there any discussion? We done. Did that do it? I mean, yeah, I, I, I think we're already yeah, discussion. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, hearing you send no indications of discussion, uh, I will call for the vote. Joe? Yes. Thank you. Tom? Yes. Thank you. Craig? Yes. Thank you. Malavika? Yes. Thank you. Judy? Yes. Thank you. And my own vote is yes. The motion carries. Okay, so then uh, since the lawyering policy was rolled into the behavior policy, um, the next item under old business is approve the elimination of the existing lawyering policy. We have a motion in that regard. I so move, Steve. Thank you, Malavika. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Judy. I have a motion and a second to approve the elimination of the lawyering policy. Uh, is there any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Uh, Joe? Yes. Tom? Yes. Craig? Yes. Malavika? Yes. Judy? Yes. And my own vote is yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Um, President's comments. Um, Oh, it's been busy. <laughs> uh, let me see. Um, I just wanted to mention I 
I will still do this, and I intend to, intend to send this out to you with an email. A um, uh, couple of things. Um, really done a great significance, but um, lest I don't get through them again for a while. Um, in the Iowa Code, uh, let me back up. Uh, a couple of meetings ago, we were um, asked to sign, um, and that just reminds me, as part of my comments, I forgot to ask uh, Casey to have print out copies for me of the um, conflict of interest or ethics policy or uh, agreement, but we'll uh, do that next month. Um, so anyway, uh, back to the subject at hand. Um, we were asked to sign a um, document that said that you know we were aware um, that if we had any uh, financial uh, conflicts of interest that we needed to make those known um, lest or else um, we could be um, removed uh, from this board. Um, and so as a result of that, I inquired as to you know where that came from because I had never seen anything before that trustees could be removed, um, you know, except for you know in a term limit. Um, but um, so I, I spoke with um, Brian Heyer and City Legal, and um, he pointed me to um, a section of the Iowa Code that actually has to do with um, kind of the administrative offices of the city, which would include like the city council and talks about the mayor pro tem and all this kind of stuff. There's like 15 sections of this thing and it goes on for page after page after page. The very last section in there has to do with city boards and commissions. And it does in fact say in there that uh, board or commission members um, or members of a board or commission of the city can be removed from office and then goes on to what that process would be. Um, the mayor would have to um, bring up his interest in their being removed. The particular board or trustee or commission member could then ask for a public hearing, and I believe it says, and I'll, I'll send you the copy of this, which I intended to do for a while now. Uh, but anyway, just uh, the point is that there is that instance um, that um, that we could be removed. So that's the, the basis for that um, item in that having to do with that um, uh, conflict of interest policy about uh, the possibility of removal of a board or commission member. Secondly, um, and along with similar, somewhat similar lines, um, um, we are limited to six-year terms, and it's always been my thought that the reason for that was is to remove the library from the political process. In other words, our terms are much longer than anyone else in city government. So, um, but I never could find that anywhere. It's not in the city and the code of Iowa that I've, at least that I've ever been able to find, having just told you that I found something that was pointed to something I didn't know it existed before. But um, um, but um, and I know because um, I actually have a cousin that came up and talking with her that um, she's in I think Waukee, uh, Iowa, and um, they have four-year terms. So it you know it seems unlikely there's something in the code about that code of Iowa. Um, but anyway, um, so. You know, I asked Jeff if, Jeff if he could um, have special uh, collections checked back and see if they could find anything about this, that there might have been a newspaper article in the paper. And they did. And my thanks to uh, Katie and uh, special yeah. services. Um, but um, it had to do with going back to a time when there were new um, changes made as a result of Davenport being a home rule city and, and basically those across the state of Iowa. Um, and that's when that was put in, but um, that's when there, there were those changes, but it didn't really address why, you know, what the reason for it was, at least as far as having to do with boards and, and, and commissions. 
Um, so uh, I ask about ask her about um, if she could maybe look back and see who was on the city council at that time that I might be able to ask somebody, you know, assuming somebody from back then, you know, hopefully somebody was still living. And she gave me three names, addresses, and phone numbers. And um, uh, one of them was Tom Hart, who was a former council oh, yeah. member and mayor. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, the article was, um, uh, it, but it it just it told me who they were in that and uh, about the election. And um, I called him, but yeah, he didn't have any recollection of that. And and um, oh, this because it wasn't controversial. Yeah, well, and also uh, suggested that that probably, you know, may have come from the library since, you know, since he said he didn't remember it, I suggested that just maybe as a bell ringer that, you know, that um, maybe had something to do with political uh, side of things. And uh, he said he didn't remember, but he thought that, that that probably would have come from the library, perhaps. And um, I looked on the board up there and uh, the person who was the library director at that time I don't know who that person was. I mean, I back to Kay Rungi, but she, that's two people before her. So, <laughs> wait, wait. so anyway, just just those things. Um, maybe there's still an answer out there, but I haven't found it. Anyway, it took way too much time with that. Moving on in the agenda. Um, board training, collection development, if there's still time, I hope. I can keep it to about 15 minutes. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sorry. No problem. No problem. Actually, this is... Um, a modified version of a training that um, one of the information services librarians Ann Hetzler and I are doing for all staff um, over the course of the next couple of weeks and that session is an hour long and I've condensed it down to about 15 minutes so if there are things that I kind of breeze through that you would like a little bit more information on please let me know and I'd be happy to expand. Um, so, um, this is going to be just an overview of how we select materials for the collections here at the library and how we manage those collections. Um, this first slide is about our material selection policy, which you're all very familiar with since it's a full into a lot of depth on this one, but wanted to touch on it since that is what ultimately guides our collection development decisions. So it gives an overview of our principles of collection development, including elements such as following the Library Bill of Rights and the freedom of reads to read statements, um, making sure that everyone has the ability to access information. Um, it clarifies that the library does not stand in place of parents, so that means that it is up to the parents or guardians of minor children to determine what they read or check out from the library. Um, and that um, it also clarifies that materials are chosen to reflect our diverse community. So um, we hold uh, we hold materials from a variety of viewpoints, um, and as such, selection for the collection does not endorse the content of those collections. Um, rather, we're choosing those items based on their merit and the needs or interests of the community. And also expands on labeling of library materials, which we just do for wayfinding purposes only. So we don't label items to denote that they're controversial in nature or um, to give other types of warnings about their content, because doing so would violate the American Library Association statement on labeling and rating systems. Uh, it also goes into the selection criteria that we use. So we add items to the collection based on popular demand, uh, accuracy of information, balance of viewpoints, funds and space, and other considerations. And then finally, there's some information in the policy about deselection of items from the collection or weeding or removing items from the collection, but I'll cover that in more depth later. Could I ask a question? Yes. Um, I was just think, looking at the diverse population. Um, it made me think, is there any, I mean, do we automatically assume that everything's in English? I mean, is there any because there are there are other communities in this community uh, it's just, you know obviously there are hispanics but there are also some folks in the asian community and i'm just wondering is there any thought as to buying stuff in other languages yes. is is that a possibility or is that not really a possibility 
We do actually have some small collections in languages other than English. So, oh, okay. um, right, so uh, in uh, Davenport, the two languages other than English that are spoken most commonly are Spanish and Vietnamese. So those are primarily the two other languages that we're purchasing materials in. Um, I think with some, um, a little bit of French and German as well. Good question. Mm -hmm. uh, so our budget, um, our materials budget is usually around $500,000 per year, a little bit up, a little bit down, depending. Um, this year it's $495,646, which is a completely flat figure from last year. Um, the money for the collection primarily comes from the city through Capital Improvement Plan or CIP funds. Um, so that we, this year we received $415,000 in CIP funds. And the rest of the materials budget comes from other sources such as open access funds that we receive from the State Library of Iowa, um, any memorial funds that have been given to the library, and then um, lost, uh, lost book money that we've received in the last fiscal year from patrons. Um, so with that big sum of money that we have, um, to divide that up into the different collection areas, I put it into a tool in our Collection HQ subscription called Spending Plan. And so that then gives me recommendations for how much of that money to put towards fiction, how much towards mysteries, towards picture books, et cetera, through our whole collection. And I mostly stick with those recommendations since it's based on circulation of those collections and the size of those collections that we currently have. Um, but I do make some little adjustments here and there just depending on what trends I've seen over the last couple of years. Um, and I also touch base with the selectors for those areas too, especially if they're carrying them over from year to year to see, you know, how much was published this last year. Did you have trouble spending those funds? Did you really need more funds? And I use their guidance there. Um, and of course there are um, more than a million items that are uh, published every year and we can't buy everything. So what we are buying for the collection, we're then augmenting with um, getting items in for our patrons from the other Rivershare libraries as well as through the Mobius system as well. So who's selecting these items for the collection? So every staff member who is in a librarian position, um, they are all selectors. Uh, only librarians do that material selection so that everyone can stay working in the appropriate job class. Um, there are currently 19 selectors total who select the 65 selection areas we have. So that includes our books, um, our audiovisual materials such as DVDs, um, audiobooks, uh, music CDs, video games, um, our non-traditional items such as the community experience passes, board games, puzzles, guitars, and the like. Um, each selector usually has between one to five selection areas, and that varies depending on what their other responsibilities are. So if you do a lot of programming, you probably don't do quite as much selection, or if you're on desk a lot, you don't, don't do quite as much selection. We want to make sure our staff have a balanced workload. Juvenile and teen areas are primarily selected by youth services and adult by information services with special collections, of course, um, purchasing materials for the special collections department. And then selection areas are assigned to each staff member. Um, I try to do that by interest and experience where possible, um, but often a lot of times our newest staff kind of end up getting what's left over, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I always make sure folks know, especially leading into the new fiscal year, that if anyone wants to make trades, they can let me know and we can certainly shift things around. Um, so how do we choose what we're buying? So we rely on professional journals to give us reviews of materials. They're providing unbiased evaluation of those materials. We subscribe to publications like Booklist, Library Journal, Publishers Weekly, um, and some other specialized ones for items such as video games and things like that. Um, we use the data from Collection HQ to help us decide uh, if we have too many or too few items in any given area of the collection. Uh, we take lots of patron recommendations and we're always happy to buy those because we know that there's community interest in the item. Um, and for those, we rely on the material selection policy to tell us if the item fits or not. So if something is, say, too academic in nature, then it might not fit as well in our public library collection. Um, we also keep an eye on the news and what topics are trending. So we want to have items to support those collections um, and looking at um, how areas like wax and wane throughout the year. So um, looking at our sports books, for example, there's a lot of baseball books that come out in the spring and football books in the fall. So just paying attention to even throughout the year as trends change. Um, of course, we don't have an unlimited budget, so we have to spend wisely. Um, we did get a request not too long ago from a patron who wanted to buy us this limited edition book about Muhammad Ali. It looked really cool, but it was $3,000. Um, so, you know, needless to say, we did not have that one. 
the collection. Uh, obviously, a way you tell. Yeah. <laughs> um, we do get a discount through the vendor who we order from, and that helps, of course, but we still have to keep costs in mind. And so to that end, a lot of times we don't buy a copy of every item for all three of our buildings. We might buy one copy for one building or buy two copies um, and then encourage our patrons to place items on hold and get them through the van delivery. So how we order items in practice. So um, most of our orders are placed through a vendor called Baker and Taylor. Um, we have other sources we can look to as well, but this is where we get most of our books. So after we've read a review of an item in a journal and decide that we want to add it to the collection, we look it up in Baker and Taylor, and that's what that first little screenshot shows. Um, and it gives us an overview of the item, um, what selection area that it is in. Um, it shows us subject headings, additional reviews of the book, how many copies are available for purchase, and much more information. So then we add it to our cart, and once we've got all of our books in our cart, then we look back at the cart, and that's what that second screenshot is, because then the librarians have to go through and add notes and grid information for all those titles. So that lets our technical services department know what building it goes to, what area of the collection it goes to. Um, we include notes if a patron requested the book, because then we'll put their library card number in there, and that way that patron automatically gets a hold on that book, and they get it first before it goes out to the shelf. I must tell you, I have got that once. Love that back. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so then once that's all ready, then we send it to our acquisitions uh, staff, and they get the items ordered. They usually don't take very long to come in, just a few days, and then they're cataloged and out on the shelf. So on the flip side of that, our librarians are also doing deselection or weeding of items from the collection. So what do we consider when we're taking something out of our collection? Primarily, that's going to be circulation. How long has it been since the item checked out? Um, and this depends on the selection area and um, the building that it's in. But most of the time, if a book hasn't checked out somewhere between two and five years, it's not useful to our community here. So we're going to remove it from the collection and see if the friends want to uh, sell it to raise money for future library endeavors. We also look at the condition of the item. Um, though with that, if it's something that has checked out a lot, um, but it's looking very worn, um, then there must be some demand for it. So a lot of times we want to buy a new copy in that case. Um, we're looking to see if there's a newer edition available with updated information. So especially things like medical books, computer books, travel guides, and the like. Um, and so even if there isn't a new edition available, if it is an older book that has potentially outdated information, um, sometimes we'll want to get that out of the collection anyway, because outdated information is not useful to our community. Um, and in the end, we are striving to create a balanced collection that offers multiple points of view. So we're going to be mindful when we are weeding, um, that we're not weeding all of one particular viewpoint, leaving nothing um, with, uh, to represent other viewpoints in the collection. So I've mentioned Collection HQ a few times, and I know that I've talked to you about Collection HQ before, so I won't go into a lot of detail here, but this is our collection management platform that we use to maintain the collection throughout the year. So it gives us automated reports to show us um, what items haven't circulated in a certain number of years. They call those dead items. Um, it gives us reports for items that have checked out lots and lots of times and might need to be replaced with something in better condition, and they call those grubby items. Um, <laughs> I think they're based in um, Scotland, I want to say, so like sometimes the, we use different terminology and it's fun. Grubby. Yes. <laughs> grubby. Yes. Um, it gives us suggestions for what items might circulate better at you know one of our branches rather than the one it's already housed at, so it can get to the patrons that um, are looking for that item better. Um, lots, lots more things. And of course, these are meant to be guidance. The librarians have the authority to use their professional judgment to say, you know, even though this report is saying to get rid of this book, I know that, um, you know, this is happening in the community, and so we might want to keep it on shelf a little bit longer. Um, so these various tasks are spread out throughout the year. That way we're not weeding the whole collection all at once because that would be quite overwhelming to our staff who are doing that discarding work, of course. Um, and this also makes sure that we are um, getting hands on our collection and eyes on it consistently throughout the year. And since we started using Collection HQ four or five years ago, um, we've seen really um, great decreases in the amount of items that are um, showing up as dead. So this chart, for example, is our juvenile nonfiction collection. So back in 2018, when we started using Collection HQ, um, I believe it was 52% of our juvenile nonfiction was considered dead. It hadn't checked out in years. Um, and now, uh, just when I ran this report last, we were at 16%. So that's not just from weeding um, items that weren't checking out either. That is also because we can use this data to look and see 
trends and what's not checking out. And so then we can make better purchasing decisions because we know what is checking out. And then um, back in November, I talked to you about our diversity, equity, and inclusion analysis tool that Collection HQ has. And so um, I just wanted to touch on that very briefly again. So as you know, uh, we adopted the following vision statement. Davenport Public Library will create a community-wide culture of learning in which all citizens use the library and see themselves reflected in the services and staff. Um, and to that end, the strategic plan um, specifically addresses collection development in this aspect um, under goal three, better engage underserved and underrepresented communities in our facilities um, with the following objective, evaluate materials and collections to determine what meets the needs of specific community groups. So to that end, we're continuing to use this tool to see how we're doing representing diverse rep um, populations in our collection. So, this chart shows the dashboard that's most up to date for Collection HQ and um, shows that right now 18.5% of our collection falls into one of their DEI topics. When we first started using this back in the fall, we were at about 16%. So we've already seen some really good growth in this area. And that's down to um, the librarians who have really been making a concerted effort to select materials that represent the community that we live in. Um, I have asked since then, that when they're putting together those carts of items, that 30% of those items are fitting into some kind of DEI topic. So that's helped to increase these numbers. So would those some of those items be books in a foreign language or about a foreign book? Yes. Um, so yeah, it's about the topic um, and not necessarily about like the identity of the author. So yes, our, our foreign language collection would fall in there. I must say, uh, uh, Hindi movies, Bollywood, I come from Mumbai, you know, and it was amazing. We, at Eastern, you have quite a lot of popular, I mean, I know people do Netflix and Hulu and all that, but there are people who will also watch DVDs. So I found a few which were like, oh my gosh, this is happening. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so so I, we have picked up Hindi movies from Eastern oh, in the past. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question, Lexi. Yes. Um, I guess two questions. One on both of them have to do with publishers, but Baker and Taylor, I mean, how do we pick them? Um, so they um, they are the ones who uh, also own Collection HQ, or um, and they work, so those work well together with um, ordering and then um, having those reports come straight through there. Collection HQ also has some selection tools that you can use. So it works really nicely to be able to like look at the selection tool in Collection HQ and say, I want to add that to my cart. And it talks very nicely to Baker and Taylor. So they give us good discounts and we tend to get materials quickly. So they've been good to work with. Yeah. Um, and the other question I have is about, <clears throat> um, I've heard and seen things about um, problems and the library world with publishers and consolidations and prices, I guess, maybe. Mm -hmm. So um, just mention also that the bulk of our material budget does come from the city, the CIP budget. I think it's about $415,000. Yep. And I can remember that number because it's been that forever. Yes. In fact, at one time, I think it was 500 or something and it actually came down yes um, but I think that's an area since I'm sure prices aren't going down that I think we need to try to figure out a way to advocate for um, some improvement in that um, you know whatever whatever is available or we might be able to talk somebody into <laughs> but no, I think it's something we really ought to be looking at and so, yeah. Yes, and when you and when you compare our materials budget to other libraries in Iowa that are of similar size, um, ours is lower. And so ammunition. I would I would love to advocate for more. <laughs> and musicians. Yes. Uh -huh. No, I, I would encourage you, and that's um, you know maybe somehow maybe the finance committee can be involved in that. I don't know, but it's, there's an angle there. Is there a way to look at um, usage over time and taking out the Endemic bubble, which has screwed everything up, or but maybe looking at you know usage, that might be a good argument to say, hey, we have so many patrons, so many books being checked out, or I don't know, but, yeah. and yeah. the cost of yeah. the relative cost yeah. of books. <clears throat> what the cost has been, gone up. What the cost has been over that same period of time when the budget's been stuck at four hundred fifteen thousand yeah. dollars, <laughs> right. which sounds like a lot of money, but you know when you're looking at books that cost three thousand, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
yeah, so uh, no, I think it's something that we, uh, you know, ought to take a serious look at just to see what we can do and, you know, um, work into that, you know, how trustees might be able to advocate for that also. Okay, great. Thank you. Anyway, okay. just a thought. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I've got one last slide if you want to hear some stats. I'll just go through this super fast. Um, just in case you're wondering how the collection's doing this last fiscal year, we circulated a little over 412,000 physical items, and that was up 27% over last year. So um, we're not going to talk about how it was low last year because yeah. of COVID. It's just yeah. focus on it being up 27%. Yeah. <laughs> we also circulated a little over 74,000 digital items, so that includes our e-books, our e-audiobooks, and our downloadable magazines. And just in case you're curious what circulates the most, um, at our three buildings, our number one circulating collection is our collection of DVDs, the adult collection of DVDs, and that's 58,000 of our circulations, um, and rounded out by the other areas that are listed here, such as picture books, adult fiction, and ebook, and so on. That's huge. Oh, yeah. um, that $413,000 number, if you say went back two years, would that be a more better comparison, roughly? Um, as far as how many circulations we've right. had, yeah, um, so we're still not back up to okay. pre-COVID levels, okay. but we're, we're inching our way there. Okay. Just real quick, like, um, myself and a lot of my friends bring books that they have read. Who does that? The collections or, or the friends? Or how do they decide which ones go in the sale, which ones go in the branch? How are those handled? Sure. So the friends um, receive those donations, and then um, particularly if there's anything that looks, you know, new or uh, popular, they think might be good for the collection, then they'll um, bring that to our attention, and the librarians will see if it's something we want to add. And if not, then the friends will go on and sell it. How often does do they do things come to the collection? Rarely. Or? You know, that's a great question, and I'm not sure off the top of my head. Oh, okay. Well, that meant, but um, so the uh, Eastern is the so do they, if they're really bad, they've thrown out, obviously. Sure. They shouldn't have brought them in the first place. <laughs> so but they seem to always have, they, they seem to do good business. Um, they do, um, yes. They, they, they come to those in Eastern. That's yeah, and, and in general, the Friends generally will pull in about $30,000 in revenue between Eastern and Fairmount primarily, plus the book cart here as well. And then the big sale they always have in the summer here. Isn't it, they still have it in Maine? Uh, yeah, sure no. yeah, yeah, that went out with the bookstores came in. Really? No, that's not true. No. Because I can go in here when I right after I moved here. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. But it has it's, been a while. I think it's the library on next city does that oh, what you just yeah. said. Was like, they had it yes, recently. Oh, we had an exchange student, I remember they went downtown, they were so excited. Yeah. And then they had to figure out how they were gonna get them home to Spain. You know? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So do we do a large sale at all anymore? We don't currently know. No. Yeah. Um, the friends sometimes advertise special sales, especially if they get a large donation yeah, of a particular is, type yeah, of okay. book, you know, buy one romance, get a second one free, right. or something like that. I do know recently we got a pretty large DVD donation that we are adding to the collection. How many was that? Was that, I want to say it was a couple thousand DVDs. Wow. 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 Nice. Yes. Yes. One person? Mm -hmm. From one person, yeah. yes. Okay. And so those are That's being fine. added to the collection. That's nice. <laughs> well, I remember one time um, the friends had a donation, um, and the person asked if if they could be picked up. And so I don't know, Zan and one of the volunteers said, "Yeah, we'll come and pick them up." <laughs> how, how many books are there? Oh, nine hundred. <laughs> 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 so it took several trips, but they got them. That's they essentially got them. what happened with these but, DVDs. Yeah, we're also yeah. saying, too, that yeah. 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 A, long time, right. a long time ago when they used to have that big sale, um, somebody donated a set of uh, books about the Civil War. And there was like maybe, oh, it was quite a number because they were in the closet over here on the shelf, and there was, yeah. I don't know, there must have been 30 volumes or something like yeah. that. And, um, you know, they actually, when they get things like that, they actually sell those separately or, um, or you know, auction them off to uh, sure. the collectors or something. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely. think that ended up bringing, you know, quite a bit of money. But um, I do. I do. Okay. Um, anything else? No, I just want to say thank you. This is my first day, first month of the next term. Uh, of six years, so it's been an honor and a great pleasure uh, to be working with 
all of the, the last six years in six months. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just going to say, you're going back. Right? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, if there's nothing else to come before this forum. I will just apologize. I realized uh, I bought a new wallet and I renewed my library card today. I haven't had a library card in years. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, 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 I wanted to say, since we've got a number of staff here, um, I wanted to thank you for being so professional through the recent controversy. And, um, you know, it it was it was unfortunate that it became so negative. I mean, it's one thing to disagree, but it's another thing to be disagreeable. Yeah. And um, yeah. you know, uh, a lot of you folks kind of just got caught in the crossfire, and that's unfortunate. Um, I want to thank you for maintaining your professionalism through the whole thing. Um, you know, what I, I think I sent an email about back when I was on city council, we changed the civil rights ordinance. And when we did that, you would have thought the sky was falling. But it blew over. Now, that was self inflicted. That wasn't similar, but I'm sure that there isn't. A lot of permanent damage from that. So, thank you. Yes. Yeah. May I ask what was the staff evaluation of that event? In terms of positive, negative, how did they feel about it? Uh, good. I, I would say um, to, if I were to pass on uh, their concerns, they were glad well, overall. If it was, this is just gross generalization, they're glad we were able to have it. Those eight teenagers were. Uh, yeah fortunate for them to be able to attend it. Uh, there was some concern about how some of the attendees and also the presenters were um, not respected when they came to and from the library. Uh, so there were some concerns for that. Uh, but overall, uh, very positive for the most part, I believe, uh, in the ability for us to have that uh, event for the, for the teenagers to be able to learn a little bit more about uh, different aspects of the world. And, and culture. Were there people there also people that were standing in the crowd, I guess, outside? Well, I don't know how many people. Yeah, there, there were about uh, 40 people that were protesting the event. And right. There were approximately uh, two people. That That's always the way it is. We received about a uh, hundred that were against uh, complaints in advance, uh, complaints against the program, and about 35 that were positive and in support. Do we know, we don't know where that, the email, I didn't get, honestly, get a lot of emails. And I think I dealt with them. I didn't hear much back when I, I mean, I just, you know, one of the things I said is, have we come to the point of not allowing parents to decide for their children? Because it was all the thing like these kids were going, you know, I hope we haven't gone to that. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> you know, I mean, basically. But um, um, but it felt very much like it was facts and that exploded and things like that. That I just really wondered if it was came out of a certain source or we you know sort of where it came from. It'd be interesting. I'm not sure what you're asking. I don't know if it was local or what my thing is. I'm not sure. Now, it, it, it is true that there were, were people who said they were local. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we get emails about controversial things all the time. And sometimes it's has nothing. They don't live anywhere close to Davenport. Sure. Um, and and it's uh, and you get the same one and or you get the same lines and you know, OK, this is not this is not somebody sitting work saying I've got a concern about this you know sure. and so it's pulled down copied it wasn't quite cut and paste like that but it was similar and I and I just wondered if it started in the city or it started sure. a broader thing that just seems to be happening you know to libraries with the Benton example that was yeah. in the newspaper today. Yeah. I think it's definitely a little a combination of both right there were definitely uh, some uh, conservative media that 
picked up on this on the national uh, line, and we received a, a number of complaints from outside of the community. Uh, it was also picked up uh, locally as well, and there were definitely a lot of uh, Davenport residents that were expressed their concern with this as well. So it's a, kind of a, a mix of individuals. But you always hear from people who are opposed to anything more than you hear. I think, yeah, and I think I'm not disagreeing with you at all, but that's kind of the way we are uh, in general because when we're satisfied, we're happy. We're and happy. We're like dissatisfied, we're upset. True, that's human nature. Upset. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. I'll accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Craig. I have a motion and a second to adjourn the meeting. All those in favor, say signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you much, everyone, for your Thank time. Thank you. Thank you. And your votes.